Today I'm going to review a Star Wars book, and Star Wars is a space opera, but it's also a political drama. Now the reason I chose this particular book that's the first two books of the Legacy of the Force series, I'll be reviewing book one today and book two at a later date. The reason I chose these is because of the political drama aspect of it. In particular, I see these books, the second book most of all, as a knee-jerk reaction to the George Bush era, that is the war in Iraq, the Patriot Act, domestic terrorist watch lists, no-fly lists, Guantanamo Bay, all that stuff, but it also also, perhaps unintentionally relates quite well, or at least I can draw parallels, to the modern conflict in Gaza. So I'll be doing these two book reviews with a focus on seeing how the story evolved out of the Bush era as a protest to the Bush era, analyzing the story itself, and then seeing how the story is applicable to the modern war between Israel and Palestine. Now, Legacy of the Force in the Star Wars universe, this is a Legends book, meaning it comes from the timeline before Disney bought the series, which means it's one of the canon ones. I don't consider any of the Disney movies to be canon, except Rogue One. Rogue One is the exception that makes the rule. Legacy of the Force is set 40 or so years after the Battle of Yavin, that is Episode 6. Offhand, I want to say 43 years, something like that. Luke has since found a wife. They have a 13-year-old son, Ben. Han and Leia have twins, actually, a boy and a girl, Jason and Jaina. They are in their late 20s, and they also have, or rather had, another son, a couple years younger than the twins, who died on a Jedi mission in a previous book. Yeah, there are dozens of these Star Wars books in the Legends universe. Even me, listening to audiobooks nonstop, the first time I listened through all of them, it took me the better part of a year to get through them all. And I do not consider that a waste of time. But more backstory, more things you missed since the movies. Luke, of course, one of the first things he does is found a new Jedi Academy. Starts trying to train up new Jedi. That Academy has since grown, trained up hundreds of Jedi. They rebuilt the Jedi Temple, they have a new Jedi Council. They are regaining the strength that we saw in the prequel trilogy, starting to resemble the level of strength that the old Jedi Order had. And spoiler alert, in this particular series, Chewbacca has since died. That happened about 10 or 15 years ago. Actually, now that I think of it, I can say it for certain. In this timeline, it was 13 or 14 years ago, because I remember Luke's wife was pregnant with Ben at the time. That was when a race of intergalactic beings, that is, a race of beings from outside of the galaxy, attempted to invade and do a conquest of the Star Wars galaxy, and the whole galaxy was forced to unite against them. That is the war in which Chewbacca and the twins' younger brother Anakin died. And just a little bit about how this series was written before I get into it. This series had three authors, as a matter of fact, and the way they arranged it, they piggybacked off of one another, so books one, four, and seven were written by author number one, that is Aaron Alston. Books two, five, and eight were written by Karen Travis, and books three, six, and nine were written by Troy Denning. For the sake of these two book reviews I'm doing, I'll only be looking at books one and two of the series, unless people really want me to continue the series. But the first three books were published in 2006, the next three were in 2007, the next four actually were in 2007, and then the last two were published in 2008. Which, I think the way they piggybacked off of each other to publish these books rapid fire like that worked out nicely in the end. I also think the way they ordered who wrote which book worked out nicely. It really played to the strengths of the individual authors. I am glad that Troy Denning got to write book nine, the final book, and I'm really glad that Karen Travis got to cover some of the most intense plot twists and also cover some of Jason's most intense character development in books two and five in particular. Now the book opens in a sort of ominous foreboding scene that is more of the space opera element of it. It's Luke and his wife Mara. Luke wakes up in the middle of the night from a bad dream, says that he had a vision from the Force of a man who doesn't exist. A man, presumably a Sith, threatening the family and the galaxy. That scene quickly wraps up though, and then we get to see the next day. Both families, Luke's family and Leia's family, are at a family dinner together. Jason and Ben, Ben is Jason's apprentice, recently got back from a mission to a Corellian weapons factory, Corellia being the homeworld of Han, of course. And this entire dinner conversation really serves as background information for the political theater, the political stage that is being set. Han is unhappy that the Jedi are imposing restrictions on these Corellian arms manufacturers, and the planetary government of Corellia is in sort of an interesting spot here. They are attempting to maintain their own military and not necessarily pay and contribute to the military of the Galactic Alliance, that is the political body that grew out of the New Republic, and they don't want to limit their own defensive capability. They're trying to maintain membership in the Alliance without having those restrictions on them. And their claim, of course, is that if there's ever a war, Corellian local
locally managed Karelian forces would be available for the GAA, the Galactic Alliance, to call upon if and when there's a need for it. And that question sort of becomes the central question of this book, the sort of initial source of tension that becomes the official cause of war. Oh yeah, spoiler alert, there's going to be a war over this. Quote from Han during this dinner, We can maintain our own military and not the tiny peacekeeping and police force the new laws are calling for. When the time comes for military action, the Karelians have always brought our own forces up under our own colors, even when we weren't members of whatever government was swinging the biggest stick at the time. We did it in the Old Republic and the New Republic. We did it in the Vong War. And at this point, his daughter, the twin Jaina, replies, Not a good example, Dad. How many lives, how many whole systems were lost in the Vong War because governments couldn't work together, didn't have standardized weapons and communications, tactics? Han replies, How many lives, how many whole systems were lost because the New Republic government was so bloated, impersonal, and stupid that it couldn't see when it was getting its rear end kicked? He continues, How many members of Borsk's old advisory council ran off to their homeworlds with personal yachts packed with treasure and left people behind to burn? At this point, Luke butts in, which is exactly what Corellia is doing. They're trying to pack up their treasure and avoid the economic toll that rebuilding civilization is taking on the rest of the Galactic Alliance. The discussion continues, and Han then comes with an interesting question later on. Is that the position of the Jedi Order? What the galaxy needs is one language, one system of measurement, one uniform, and one flag. And that is certainly something we can compare to the real world. One language, Esperanto. One system of measurement, of course, the metric system. One uniform, either the EU or the UN and one flag, again, either the EU or the UN. One could imagine and compare it to the economic mandates of the WEF, and one could question what would happen if these people were given authority to boss around nation-states, to interfere with local laws and override local laws. I certainly wouldn't see anything good with that, but I think the reader at this point is meant to feel sympathy for the Alliance. Or perhaps sympathy for both sides, because there are rights and wrongs on both sides. Both sides are correct in a way. And another question is also briefly touched on the involvement of the Jedi order the proper level of involvement of Jedi in government activity. And that's a question that gets heavily addressed in the following series after Legacy of the Force. More on that later on if I ever get to it. Something interesting happens after this family dinner, though. Luke and Jason are by themselves out on the balcony, and Luke confides to Jason that he's surprised that Han's worried about Jedi walking around the government halls in Corellia, not because he's being paranoid, but because he's not being paranoid. Something along those lines actually is in the plans you see. The Galactic Alliance found out about a secret Corellian assault fleet that they've been building for months. The source of this information, though, is not the, not the most solid. The source of the information comes from accounting reports and from just analyzing troop movements. They inferred this information based on a strong suspicion, based on a very educated guess, but still it's based on accounting reports. But Luke tells Jason this, and tells him they've been looking at this data, tracking these reports over a period of 10 years. They're as certain as they can be that there is a secret fleet, and furthermore, Centerpoint Station. That is a prehistoric space station. It's a facility big enough and with a strong enough gravity influencing tool that Universe lore tells us. This station actually pulled all of the five habitable planets of the Corellian system into the Goldilocks zone, into that perfect position where they could all five of them, five planets around one star, all producing life. This station that had been deactivated for decades, the only recent activation in anyone living memory happened during the Yuzhan Vong War, when Jason's younger brother actually, now deceased Anakin Solo, just so happened to have the very unique biometric brain pattern that the station responded to and allowed him to utilize it. Anakin then soon after died in the Vong War. However, Galactic Alliance military intelligence now believes that the station is very close to being reactivated, which that would be enough to cause worry in anyone. I want to pause here though and take a slightly closer look at the characters of Ben and Jason. Ben, you see, he he was a baby through most of the Vong War. Very Force-sensitive, he's the son of Luke Skywalker and another powerful Jedi. A lot of natural Force talent, but during his infant years he grew up feeling the horrors of war through the Force. So he spent a long period of time being sort of traumatized by that, sort of mistrustful of the Force, not really wanting to connect to it as much. However, he recently found a quality teacher who's been able to sort of get him out of his shell. That quality teacher is Jason Solo, Ben's cousin, I believe 16 years older than him. And not only that, Jason has a sort of an array of unique abilities himself. You see, after the Vong War, 
there weren't really a lot of novels I could find about this part of his life, but after the Vong War, he went on a sort of quest around all these forgotten parts of the galaxy where he sought out species who had unique force abilities and he learned from them. And one of these unique abilities he learned was flow walking, which is sort of like if you've ever read the Foundation series, if you know how that type of mathematic works where they calculate likely futures for the galaxy. It's sort of like that, except Jason uses the force for it. He's able to reach into the force and analyze all these likely futures depending on sometimes depending on different variables. And of course, I probably forgot to mention, Jason went on this whole trip around the galaxy after being a prisoner of the Yuzhan Vong for an extended period of time. And part of being a prisoner of the Vong, it gets a little weird. The Yuzhan Vong as a species have sort of this, like, fetish for pain. And Jason learns that. He embraces that part of it. It sort of broke his mind a little, but at the same time, he came out of it with a plethora of unique, seldom-studied abilities that not a lot of other Jedi can have a good understanding of. But anyway, back to Jason's conversation with Luke. Admiral Pelion, who is a high-ranking admiral in the Galactic Alliance, old as dirt, as a matter of fact, he was a member of the Imperial Army back in the day, but now he's an admiral in the GA. Admiral Pelion sees rebellion as an inevitable result of inaction on the Alliance's part. So he's putting pressure on these top figures in the Alliance. We have to do something. We can't just sit around and watch this happen all around us. Alliance Chief of State Kyle Omas has decided that they're going to send a team of Jedi into Center Point Station to sabotage the controls and make the station inoperable. Luke, the Grand Master of the Jedi, has chosen Jason for this task because Jason has a Corellian background. Jason's father, Han, is from Corellian. And because he has a lot more versatility with all those out-of-left-field curveball force abilities that he's studied. And Luke, of course, gives Jason the choice of whether or not to bring his apprentice on this dangerous mission, his apprentice being Ben. Luke, rightfully according to tradition, separates himself emotionally from this choice that he's giving Jason. Jason chooses to bring Ben along on the mission. Meanwhile, flash over to a scene with Han and Leia after the family's left. Han is getting suspicious because his communications with some of the people he knows on Corellia have been uh, slow. He sees this as a sign that they're possibly being monitored, they're possibly being intercepted, decrypted, observed, re-encrypted, and then sent to their final destination, probably by Galactic Alliance intelligence. Now this puts Leia in an interesting position. Leia is a former head of state at this point, and she's torn between loyalty to her husband and loyalty to the Jedi and the Galactic Alliance. But nevertheless, this couple chooses to investigate things a little further. So they gather all sorts of data on economic changes, troop movements, military strength for both Corellia and the rest of the Alliance, plug it into a supercomputer, and they get the result that Corellia is likely to get a military beating in the very near future. Now this leaves them with the question of what to do with that knowledge. Do they warn Corellia or not? Quote from Han, Leia, there's gotta be room in this galaxy for independence, for chaos. In a galaxy as tidy, as controlled, as sanitary as you're talking about, I never could have happened. So they very much feel torn between a one galaxy government and a galaxy where there's a lot more unpredictable variables going around. The book bounces around between different characters a lot. I'm gonna continue with Han and Leia for one minute more, but give you the knowledge that other things have been, other scenes have been happening in between this. So here's another quick scene where they're calling Luke just to get a feel for things. They figure out Luke is away on a mission because the background and Luke's camera on the video call looked a lot like a military ship and Luke was wearing a pilot's uniform. Luke, of course, gave some excuse, but they could figure out where he was and what he was doing. They figure out that Luke is already getting suited up to go out on a mission. Flash over to another character, Wedge Antilles. This is one of the characters that each of those authors, when they piggyback off each other, the author of books 1, 4, and 7, has the Antilles family as their signature side characters. Wedge Antilles, one of the pilots that flew with Luke Skywalker back in the movies, back against the Empire, had a long and very successful career as a pilot and as an officer in the Galactic Alliance military. Currently retired, but a Galactic Alliance officer visits his house in the middle of the night, actually tries to convince him to come out of retirement. They twist his arm a little, saying, if it wasn't an absolute emergency, if we didn't need to talk to you right now, we wouldn't be visiting your house in the middle of the night. So he says, okay, fine. He gets dressed, says goodbye to his family, and he goes out with them. They take him to a military facility, they put him in a room, and they tell him his orders are to stay put for the indefinite future. And this is where the mask comes off, and they realize Wedge, being Corellian, they want him in one place where he's not able to provide direct support for Corellia during the coming military conflict. Quote from Wedge, I said no, you know. When officers of the Corellian military came to me and said there could be trouble between us and the GA, 
I said, sorry fellas, I'm retired. That way I'd be with my family if something happened. But now, someone somewhere on the GA end of things has decided I need to be out of the way for what's going to happen. Wedge's jail guard is pretty unsympathetic and has sort of a sour view towards the hyped up heroes of the rebellion that Wedge is one of those heroes. They get into a brief conversation about galactic history though, and here's an interesting quote that doesn't necessarily relate to Wedge's character, but does relate to the general feeling, the general attitudes in this book. The attitudes of the public towards recent history, quote, The Empire would have kicked the Yuzhan Vong in the teeth, and I wouldn't have lost almost everyone I knew when I was a kid, end quote. Basically saying that if the rebellion never would have happened, then the Yuzhan Vong invasion would not have taken so many planets, taken so many lives, so many people wouldn't have died. Flashback to Han and Leia. They are now meeting with Adel Saxon, who is the Five World Prime Minister for Corellia. That is the Corellian star system. Han is warning Saxon of the immediate imminent GA attack, and this conversation goes in a sort of interesting direction. Saxon seems to be very much straddling the line between getting benefits from Galactic Alliance membership and trying to get benefits from independence as well. Saxon tries to push Han to be a public figurehead in support of Corellia. Han's condition, though, is that Adele Saxon must first resign her position. She, of course, refuses. And then the last thing we see before the battle officially beginning in earnest is Wedge figuring out a clever way to escape the cell that he's in. Now, here's what the GA has planned. They're doing a few simultaneous operations. First of all, there's going to be an assault fleet that flies into orbit around the main world of the Corellian system, that is Corellia itself. And at the same time, there's going to be a team of Jedi going into center point station with essentially a super customized USB drive that that fits a very specific input port within that station's control room. Their mission is to insert that drive, which will then activate a timed self-destruct sequence of the station. And at the same time all this is going on, there are also two teams of Jedi on the ground on Corellia. Their missions are to kidnap Prime Minister Adel Saxon, and I believe his position at this point is Chief of State, that is Thrakken Sal Solo, that is the cousin to Han Solo, a guy that the Skywalker family has had uh, less than pleasant run-ins with in the past. And meanwhile, there will be one more team of Jedi. These Jedi will be pilots, they will be the extraction team for the Jedi that are on the ground on Corellia. And the commander of the GA assault fleet, his name is Admiral Kloskin, and the fleet's flagship is the Dodonna. And at the same time all this is going on, I mentioned that the first author's set of side characters that they have is the Antilles family. Well, Wedge's daughter, Sial Antilles, happens to be serving as a pilot in the Galactic Alliance, and she is serving under a fake name because, of course, her ancestry is Corellian. Well, that wasn't actually the main reason. The main reason was because her father is a celebrity, a hero of the last war, and she wanted to make a name for herself on her own. But now that this whole situation is popping up, it becomes very convenient for her to hide her Corellian identity. And I'll give a quote from the book that I think could be relevant. Quote, Down on Corellia, all eyes would be attached to the gleaming beauty of the GA military, to the flowing formation whose very presence said, do not defy the most powerful authority in the galaxy. Unquote. And I'd like to compare that to the war in Kuwait, or the war in Libya, where the American and NATO forces just rolled in with overwhelming strength. They had the biggest, shiniest toys around, they had the most manpower around, completely demoralizing the enemy, completely overwhelming the entire situation, the entire region, in one huge show of force. It worked in the examples I gave in Kuwait and in Libya. In other places, it has not worked so well, and in this book, we'll get to see a little bit of a wild card thrown into the mix. And I suppose I'll go one by one, describing each character viewpoint through the battle and sticking with one character until the conclusion of the battle at that point I move on to the next character and that contrasts with how the book presents it the book jumps around dozens of times to all different scenes throughout this whole process I'll start with Jason and Ben in center point station Jason has Ben trail behind him far enough away that it won't be obvious that Ben is with Jason Jason of course being dressed as a Jedi recognized as a Jedi he encounters all the security of the station all the Corellian security officers we see him detecting and dodging explosives, going through doors, batting away blaster bolts, which is the Star Wars equivalent of gunshots. He gets to a point, though, where he encounters Thraken Sal Solo himself. That's right, Sal Solo is not on Corellia. Sal Solo is, in fact, in Center Point Station, and, according to him at least, he is there directing the security of the station to be prepared for special attacks, Jedi attacks, because they know that a Jedi attack is coming. We hear from Sal Solo that he expected Luke Skywalker himself to come, and he surprised 
surprised that it's Jason. Meanwhile, Ben, who sees that Jason is otherwise occupied, realizes that it is his mission to get to the control room with or without Jason, himself if need be, and find some way to either disable the station completely or to initiate a self-destruct. So Ben, realizing that he's 13 years old, realizes that if he's not dressed like a Jedi, he won't be recognized as a combatant or a Jedi. He would be recognized as a civilian child. So he does something a little clever. He takes off his Jedi robe and he goes around in an undershirt and presumably pants and just running straight to the goal like that he's able to bypass a whole lot of security measures that Jason wouldn't have been able to get by so quickly. Meanwhile Jason finds that Sal Solo does in fact have specialized defenses against Jedi including a sort of hypersonic sound gun that emits a certain tone, a certain frequency when the force is used. Something that a Jedi would pick up and a Jedi would feel pain when they hear this sound but a normal person would not. But here's a quote from the book, quote, Jason knew more about pain than his opponents realized. At the height of the Yuzhan Vong War, he'd been a prisoner for months, subjected to their treatments and customs of self-inflicted agony. He had learned to function within their embrace of pain and other rituals that would break beings not accustomed to such hardships. A sudden infliction of pain could surprise him, surely, but it couldn't keep him down. And that's just one of the ways that Jason's time being a prisoner of the Yuzhan Vong has shaped him, has honed his personality and his techniques, his abilities. And that's probably one of the ways that Luke Skywalker was talking about him being a more versatile Jedi than most. And we see it pay off here. But while Jason is dealing with Sal Solo, Ben makes it to the control room, does a little bit of sneaky Jedi business to get past the door guards, the guards at the door to the control room, the central control room for the entire entire station, makes his way inside, and he finds something very strange indeed. He finds a robot, a droid as the Star Wars universe calls it. This droid believes that it is the deceased Anakin Solo. The droid has been programmed with the brainwaves of Anakin Solo. In fact, it even has a collection of magnetic tricks that it can play that on the surface might seem like the droid is force sensitive, but Ben recognizes that it's only magnets arrayed in the room. Even the security cameras in the room the droid does have access to that footage, but the security cameras have been altered in order to present the droid as appearing to be human. Ben, of course, who has not seen Anakin since he was one year old, Ben is faced with a few weird feelings about this, but he tries to convince the droid that it is a droid. And he does this by taking out one of his own cameras and having the droid record a short video of things that the droid wants to say to Anakin's parents, Han and Leia, and then shows the footage to the droid, of course. Ben's camera camera isn't altered, the droid sees itself as a droid. And over time, Ben actually is able to wear down on the droid's determination to see itself as human, and eventually convinces it that it is a robot. The droid then calls itself Anakin Sal Solo, Thraken's offspring. And with this realization, the droid itself, who had previously trapped Ben, the droid itself, scrambles all the programming, all the work that the Corellians had done to try and get the station back into operation, as well as deleting all the records they had on Anakin Solo's brain patterns, so they can't use that trick again to get the station operational. Jason, though, he has a little bit of a weird experience with Thraken. There is a moment where he ultimately overcomes all the security measures, and he has Thraken backed into a corner, essentially. And I see this as a callback to... Revenge of the Sith movie where Anakin has Dooku on his knees. He could kill him in a second, and Palpatine tells him to do it. Quote from Thraken, Jedi don't kill prisoners who have surrendered, unquote. Quote from Jason, perhaps Jedi don't, but I might, end quote. And at that point, do you remember what I said about the flow walking that Jason is able to do? Well, Jason wastes a few precious seconds going through all sorts of different potential futures. He looks at all sorts of futures where Thraken is allowed to survive this day. Quote from the book, Pilot versus pilot, soldier versus soldier, but no one was guilty. Neither side was more evil, more dark, unquote. He sees all the horror of war and is a little bit overwhelmed by that in that particular moment. But his conclusion from that is that it doesn't matter if Thraken has surrendered, he needs to go. But in the crucial moment before he's about to do it, Thraken is able to pull one last distraction for Jason out of his sleeve. And in that crucial moment, Thraken's able to escape and get away. Now over to the next team, that would be Jaina and Zex team on Corellia who are going to kidnap 
kidnap Adel Saxon, Zek being one of the Jedi who was trained at the Academy all the way from childhood with the twins, and at this point has become a potential romantic interest for Jaina, much to her father's discomfort. Jaina, Zek, and a few others are on this mission. They identify a transport that is supposed to be carrying Adel Saxon. They enter the transport ships, but instead of the Prime Minister, they find assault droid security droids, and they realize the transport was a decoy the Corellians knew they were coming. They do manage to get away safely after that, with only some minor injuries. Luke, who's flying the extraction team, comes in. However, the extraction team loses their transport, and all they're left with are X-Wing fighters piloted by Jedi. They radio into Central Command and ask if there would be another transport coming, but they don't get a response. So at the end of the day, Luke has to go in there and load the Jedi ground teams onto the X-Wings. Now, I mentioned the other mission, the one to go into Cell Solo's home, Thrakken Cell Solo, and attempt to kidnap him. That mission was led by Tahiri Vela, who was previously the love interest of the now-deceased Anakin Solo. She is someone who went through with the Jedi Academy with him. She comes back from the mansion mission, rendezvous with the team that was supposed to kidnap Saxon, and reveals to them that, on the spur of the moment, they willingly chose to leave one Jedi behind inside the mansion to gather information. So the teams meet up, Luke picks them up, mission failed successfully. Now, over to the assault fleet itself. The fleet jumps in, and shortly after the Galactic Alliance fleet gets there, we of course know that somewhere in the world, Corellia does have that secret fleet they've been building. Well, that secret fleet jumps in, and we now see two galactic battle fleets over Corellia of equal size, having sort of a standoff, sort of a stare down. Admiral Klauskin is completely indecisive here. Asked several times for revised orders, doesn't have any idea. He receives Luke's message calling in for another transport, doesn't have any idea. Fighters from both sides start launching out of carrier vessels. At first, there's no live fire, they're just playing the game of getting each other in their crosshairs. But then at one point, live fire does start, and the fighters start actually dogfighting each other. At this point, Klauskin decides, if he can't make a show of force here, he's going to go to the fifth planet out from the sun in this star system, the inhabited planet of Trellis. And completely on the fly, he's going to launch a planetary invasion of this planet, which we learn is less of a challenge than it would seem at first, because the planet is not very populated. So he calls all the fighters back to the ships, and that's what they do. And Reladir, the capital city of Trollis, we're told that it takes about two hours to capture the entire city. Klauskin at this point retires to his quarters, and something interesting happens here. He hallucinates that he's having a conversation with his dead wife. He sees her, or at least a woman who looks like her, literally in the room with him, talking with him, telling him he did a good job today. And we're told later that after this event, he appears to absolutely lose his mind. So, in conclusion, pretty much every single part of that operation, except for the sabotaging of Centerpoint Station, has not gone to plan at all. Here's a quote from inside JA government offices while they're debriefing on all this. Quote, The operation was supposed to force the Corellians to realize they can't get to rebuild their giant blaster in space. We were to take the giant blaster away and wrap their hands with our knuckles. We failed to wrap their hands, but we did take their giant blaster away. End quote. Meanwhile, there's a little bit of shifting around inside the Corellian government. Thracken Sal Solo takes over the War Department, and Wedge Antilles, who has found his way back to the Corellian government after escaping, he is no longer in retirement. He is appointed to be the chief liaison between Sal Solo's office and Saxon's office. The occupation of the world of Trallis made the entire Corellian system fighting mad, and everybody knows it. The outrage is even rippling out to some of the neutral worlds, some of the worlds in the GA that are neutral on this conflict question, whatever you want to call it. The occupation of Trallis has been an absolute nightmare for the news cycle. So, a diplomatic delegation is called to attempt to negotiate peace between the two parties. They choose a neutral third-party location. The location turns out to be a very ritzy hotel and leisure space station, like a space yacht. The name of this place is Toriaz Station. Interestingly, even though the Jedi are heavily tied with the Galactic Alliance government, both parties agree that the Jedi can be the non-biased security force for this peacekeeping delegation. Han is allowed in as a Jedi consultant. Luke gets to the station and instantly starts feeling a little nagged, a little bugged by that guy that doesn't exist, that he's been getting visions about. Wedge is there, and his old war buddy from the other side, Tycho Selchu, is also there. And the meeting suddenly starts to feel like a party. But one interesting note, though, the head of state of the Galactic Alliance is not the one that's chosen to negotiate. In an interest of equaling the status of the negotiators, the head of state for five worlds on the Corellian side is sent in to negotiate with a very high-ranking military general on the other side, that is Admiral Pelion. I briefly introduced him before. 
And here's a quote from the opening negotiations after they get around to it. Quote, Corellia has at times thrived as part of a wider government. She has also thrived as an independent state, but she can't thrive as a disarmed state dependent on GA forces for protection of the system. Corellian pride won't allow for that, end quote. So again, we see Idol Saxon straddling the line. She wants independence, she wants benefits, but she doesn't want to pay her way through the alliance. She proposes maintaining membership in the alliance by allowing Corellia to keep their own standing army. Pelion shoots back, well, um, you can do that, but you'd still have to contribute to the GA military. But then it's pointed out that the cost of doing that would be laughably high. Now here's where the funny business starts. Jason cannot feel the man who doesn't exist when Luke asks him about that, but he does feel the faintest whiff of quote, malevolent female presence, unquote. We then get to see a different scene where this malevolent female presence plays mind tricks on the station's chief security officer and ultimately tricks him into allowing her to dock a transport ship at one of the airlocks and allow an entire strike team of soldiers to enter the station. Following this, she convinces him that there is a ship in the airlock waiting to take him away. Plot twist, there is no ship. He steps into the airlock, presses the button to open it, and he is sucked out into space. Now, this strike team of soldiers are interesting as well. They are essentially cancer patients. They are doomed men. They are people who each have their own special degenerative disease that will soon end them. They don't have long to live. And furthermore, they each have one of those cyanide pills in their mouths so they don't get taken alive. These people go in in the middle of the night and try to kill both heads of state. The Jedi detect them too late. Everyone wakes up too late. There's a whole battle and Pelion's body double ends up dead, and Idol Saxon, head of state for the Corellian system, ends up dead. It will be a running joke throughout this book series how often Corellian heads of state end up dead. It's decided that Denjax Tepler will be acting prime minister until new elections can take place. And in the aftermath, when they're analyzing the dead bodies of the assassins, they find that about three quarters of them are of Corellian descent. Jason definitely gets force impressions at this point, and it was also well noticed that these assassins did have anti-Jedi weapons with them. Jaina, when she She's searching the airlock area, finds an interesting item. It's a bundle of mysterious tassels. Now, when Luke is assigning investigation projects to his various Jedi, he assigns investigation of the tassels to Jaina. However, interestingly, Jason, who gets a strong force intuition from these tassels, asks Jaina to switch tasks with him, and she does. So now Jason and Ben have the task of figuring out where these tassels came from, what they mean, chasing that particular loose end. There's a brief scene where Luke visits one of the other Jedi Masters, Corrin Horn. Corrin is of Corellian descent, living on Corellia. Luke finds that Corrin's wife, Mirak, is on house arrest because her loyalty has come into question. Meanwhile, Luke's wife, Mara Jade, has a secret meeting with the Jedi that stayed behind to hide in the Sal Solo mansion. During this meeting that Mara has, she finds email records, some of Sal Solo's communications. She finds that he received an email from a mystery person a little bit before the attack on the Toria station, offering information beforehand about the attack. But when they take this back to the GA, it's surmised that he has plausible deniability. He could have ignored this email. He could have just thought it was a random crazy person. There's no proof that he actually took it seriously and he actually had any information about this attack. But now for a little bit of a weird scene, Han and Leia, now back on Corellia, have a meeting with Denjax Tepler, that is the new acting prime minister. And Tepler is in a weird position where he knows that the position he's in makes him a mark man, and he makes sort of a weird decision based on that. He decides to invite Han and Leia to secretly listen in on one of the war meetings. Quote from Tepler, you know as well as I do that there can't be a peace initiative until the GA is off trellis. The GA can't negotiate the departure because they've already tried and failed. The GA can't just leave because it would be too big a loss of face, too big a humiliation, even greater than being driven off because it suggests they were wrong in the first place, and the Corellians won't even start thinking about peaceful solutions while there's an occupying force on Trellis. There can't be peace until an act of war drives the GA off of the system. And you know it. And if you were to tell the GA government our plans, we couldn't succeed in driving them out." End quote. That's his reasoning for cluing Han and Leia into what the Corellian government is planning as far as war goes. Now, this meeting goes in an interesting direction. Sal Solo and Admiral Carathis, who's a minor character you don't need to worry about, they suggest using bombers disguised as Galactic Alliance ships to strike a civilian area during the battle in order to win a PR victory, at least. Wedge objects to this. He presents an alternate plan, and he suggests that if they do 
go forward with this plan of using civilian deaths to win a PR victory, it would eventually be found out. Wedge proposes to strike at a shield generator with a very small number of prototype bombers flown in an absolute crazy flight path in order to get around the shield surrounding the capital city of that planet. The plan is actually to go through, fly through a building in construction. And Wedge proposes, because this is such a crazy mission, using equally crazy pilots. He proposes using grizzled old war veterans for this mission. And of course, Han Solo is secretly listening in. The people in the war meeting seem to like this plan. At the end of that meeting that Han and Leia spectated, Thraken pulls Wedge aside and gives him a proposal. Basically tries to intimidate, extort, what have you, him into communicating to his daughter, who Thraken knows is serving in the Galactic Alliance military, to do whatever Thraken says. No, I won't tell you what I'm gonna tell her, don't worry about it. Wedge says no. Meanwhile, flashing directly over to her, seeing how that plays out, Sial Antilles is a approached by the Corellian agent. The agent pulls her aside to a private spot, starts to give her his pitch, but before he can say very much, she shoots him, and then she reports directly to her commanding officer. And in reporting to her commanding officer, the truth comes out that she is, in fact, the daughter of Wedge Antilles. The commanding officer tries to discharge her. However, that person's commanding officer overrides the discharge and instead sends y'all to serve in a different unit flying a different kind of aircraft. Now, over to Jason and Ben, who are investigating getting those tassels. They figure out that the tassels, each tassel is written in a tactile language. So it's sort of like a writing system, but you have to feel the knots with your hands in order to figure out what it says. He finds one expert in one of the languages, translates one of the tassels, he will strengthen himself through pain. But that expert refers him to another expert on the planet of Lord. So Ben and Jason go to Lord. They meet the Jedi who is stationed there locally, a Jedi named Nalani. Nalani refers them to this expert that they're looking for. The expert translates several other of the tassels for them. He will ruin those who deny justice. He will remake or rename himself. He will choose the fate of the weak. He will choose how he is loved. And by the way, it is mentioned that these pronouns are specifically male pronouns. He will win and break his chains. He will shed his skin and choose a new skin. He will strengthen himself through sacrifice. He will crawl through his cloak. He will know brotherhood. He will make a pet. And there's even one of the tassels that Jason is able to read just by using his force intuition. That one reads, he will be drawn from peace into conflict, or his life will be balanced between peace and conflict. This is a tassel that Nalani can't read, and the language just so happens to come from one of the ancient Sith worlds. So that's an interesting piece of information, and also a lot of these tassels, if you know very much about Star Wars lore, you will recognize the similarities to the Sith code that are in a lot of these phrases. Meanwhile, while they're talking to the expert, Ben is not in that meeting. Ben, just by chance, is able to locate the shuttle. Do you remember the shuttle that dropped off the mercenaries? Ben is able to locate that shuttle that just so happens to be parked there on Lord in the space station. So he finds that, and he finds Jason and Nalani, who are coming out of that meeting. The shuttle is owned by someone of the name Brisha Sayo, who, as they're going back to look at the shuttle, is apprehended by the station police. So, of course, the Jedi take her and interrogate her. Sayo claims that she was not responsible for the attack on Toria's station. However, she admits to being involved in it, and she admits to leaving the tassels behind because she knew that Jason, only Jason, would be the one that would follow the tassels all the way here. She offers to take the Jedi back to her home on a nearby asteroid, you know, normal, to tell them the full story. Jason, of course, would like to go to this asteroid, and Nelani insists on going with him despite a little bit of excuse-making from Jason. And now, the plot starts to advance more quickly. That war meeting that was had on Corellia. Well, that attack, that mission to retake the planet, that attack, that mission to retake the planet of Trollis, that is beginning today. Leia, as a matter of fact, goes to visit the starship Dodonna, that is the flagship of the Galactic Alliance military in the Corellian system. She goes to visit just as a diplomat, but secretly she knows when the mission will begin, and what she's doing there is whatever she can subtly do in order to help Han survive. So the operation is beginning. Han and Wedge are each flying one of those new prototype bombers in this crazy mission to bring down the shields. Jaina and Sial Antilles are, as a matter of fact, both flying on the GA side. The GA has the brand new shiny Ala 
F starfighters that the Corellians don't know much about because this is the first time they've been flown. The Corellians have these brand new Shriek bombers that the GA doesn't know much about because this is the first time they've been flown. The battle begins, the Shrieks go in, flying low in the city, going on their planned path through the building, and Leia, during the action, she's able to change the targeting priority on some of those targets to keep the worst of the Starfire away from Han and Wedge. Now, this battle becomes an action-packed segment here, dogfighting, flying dramatically, but at the end of the day, they bring down the shields, the planet is retaken. Now, flashing back over to the group of Jedi who are visiting the asteroid of Brisha Sayo, they learn from her that the asteroid is the former administration office for a mining company. Says that this facility was forgotten about because one of the last executives in that mining company happened to be a Sith, not a Sith who tried to conquer the galaxy or went on a megalomaniac frenzy or anything, but a Sith who just lived an unassuming life and prospered financially. But sat, but that Sith arranged for this facility to be abandoned and left unused. Brisha admits to being a student of the Sith, a student of the Force. She says that before the mining company was here, the asteroid was home to a race of intelligent Minox. Now this Minox society had sort of a rift with each other, but long story short, eventually one side learned how to use the Force and was able to leverage the dark side of the Force to win that conflict, and from then on the Minox were Force-sensitive and this location had strong traces of dark side energy. The Minox eventually died out though, and then the mining company took over. Darth Vectivus, who Jason had never heard of, was the one associated with that mining company. Jason asks, how did he keep from being ruled or ruined by greed? The answer that Brisha gives, he developed a strong ethical code before he was ever pulled by the dark side. The Sith who were famous for being bad, she says, were the ones that were that way because they were deranged men or women to start with, not because they were Sith. And Brisha then gives the example of Jason's grandfather, Anakin Skywalker, Darth Vader. And she claims to have met him. But that's off the point. She finally admits that her reason for bringing them here was that there is a Sith in the basement of this asteroid, and she would like to have Jedi assistance before confronting this Sith. I'm sure Ben, Jason, and Nalani are all very eager to do that. Nevertheless, they persisted. They entered the mines and caves part of this asteroid. They go down in sort of like a minecart thing, if you can imagine that, and it's a little gravity environment as well. Ben and Nalani very quickly get separated. The way that happens is they seemingly fly out of the minecart. They land somewhere on the ground, and they get assaulted by hundreds of phantom Minox, which if you don't know what Minox are, they're sort of like, imagine a giant bat, but it lives in outer space. It can survive in the vacuum of space, and it feeds off stellar radiation. Now, Jason felt Brisha use the force to push those two out of the minecart. It's only those two in the minecart still at this point. He says something to her. She admits, yeah, she did it. I actually forget what excuse she gave for doing that at the time, but they go down to the appropriate place within the mines, and Jason meets a Sith, but not a physical person, a Force Shadow of a Sith. And then the Sith retreats, and instead another Force Shadow appears. This one appears to be Luke Skywalker, only with a beard. And Jason and the Shadow Luke enter into combat. Meanwhile, Ben gets separated from Nalani, but he also finds his own Force Shadow. Do you want to guess who it is? That's right, Mara. And do you want to guess what the real Luke and Mara are doing right now? They're in their homes on Coruscant, many star systems away. They are are woken up in the middle of the night by force projections, dark side force projections, taking the form of Jason and Ben. Now, if you guessed that these force projections are sort of puppets and do the same actions at the same time as the real Jason and Ben, and then the same thing with the Luke and Mara force projections, you guessed correct. And if any one of the four successfully lands a hit on another one with a lightsaber, you guessed it, the real one is going to get hurt. But luckily, Brisha ends the fight. Hey, spoiler alert, Brisha is the one causing the force projections, she ends it in time before any of them get hurt, admits to Jason that she was the one that made the force projections, and then her and Jason have a really frank conversation. She admits to Jason her true name. Did anyone really believe she gave her true name before? Her true identity is Lumaya, who was the apprentice to Darth Vader, and over the years, because of injuries she sustained, she has quite a copious amount of bionic parts, like how Luke has the bionic hand, and how Vader had all those mechanical limbs. Lumaya's the same way, only apparently she has even more bionic 
parts than Vader. Lumaya begins explaining that Jason has already had a lot of Sith training. Can you guess where? Three guesses, I'll tell you. It was during his captivity with the Yuzhan Vong, where he had a lot of interaction with a strange creature, a strange alien species, I should say, former Jedi over a hundred years old who left the galaxy way back when, and was never heard from again, but in fact, this alien woman creature, Vergere, her name is Vergere, she found the Yuzhan Vong, and she came with them back to the Star Wars galaxy when the Yuzhan Vong invaded, and Jason got to interact with her quite a bit when he was captured by the Vong. Lumaya is now telling him that this figure was training him to be a Sith, saying that survival is a Sith trait, while self-sacrifice is a Jedi trait, leveraging that challenging time when he was in captivity to try and persuade him to take even more Sith instruction seriously. And that's when Nalani walks in, and Nalani wants to arrest Lumaya and take her back to a civilized world for a trial. Jason, on the other hand, is very intrigued, but now that Nalani knows who Lumaya is, he realizes there's no way to just have a casual interest in learning this stuff without being more invested into it, without being dedicated enough to it to either kill or silence Nalani. And here's an interesting part. Lumaya says that one of the three people in that room are about to die, and at that point, Jason goes into one of his flow walking trances and looks at all the potential futures, and he does not see a way that all three of them, Jason, Brisha, or Lumaya, and Nalani walk out of there alive. At this point, Nalani takes her lightsaber out and attacks Lumaya, and Jason stops her. Lumaya tells Jason that Thraken is the one who was responsible for the attack on Toriad Station, and the man who doesn't exist who Luke is seeing, well, all along, that's been Jason. Not the current Jason, but the Jason that he is destined to become, Sith version of Jason. Nalani takes another lightsaber swing at Lamaya, and at this point Jason uses his own lightsaber to block that attack. Things are getting real. So they all take a step back, they all put their weapons away, they all calm down. Nalani reaffirms that she's not walking out of here without arresting Lamaya, and Jason tells her no. Direct quote, the law is what we make of it, unquote. But something surprising happens, Lumaya consents to be arrested, and she makes an oath. She declares that she will be in the service of Jason. She will do whatever Jason asks, if Jason wants her to be arrested, so it shall be. So Nalani tries to put handcuffs on her, and Jason once again goes into a flow walking trance and sees all these potential futures, goes down all these different paths, all these different options that could be. But in almost every one, he sees the death of Luke Skywalker, and he sees the destruction and the forgetting of all the knowledge that Lumaya has. If Lumaya gets arrested, Lumaya dies and Luke dies, and there's a big war. And at this point, Jason takes out his lightsaber, and he has a brief fight with Nalani, but Jason is a much more skilled fighter than Nalani. Jason wins that fight, and Nalani dies. Direct quote from Lumaya, quote, There is this about being a Sith. We strengthen ourselves through sacrifice, unquote. Now, this would not be a B-list history book review if I didn't go off on some religious tangent. Do you remember if you happen to have watched or listened to the book review I did on The Oath by Frank Peretti? Do you remember the part where the protagonist of that book puts his hand on the dragon, but then he feels preemptively guilty for the death of all that knowledge? And in that book review, I compared it to the burning of the Library of Alexandria. This desire to preserve knowledge for the sake of knowledge, this eagerness to know everything, even things that are evil, even sometimes knowing that it's evil. It is a very real temptation, and it's not one that's often expected. Now, I'm not saying all knowledge is bad, after all, look at my channel. I literally started broadcasting out of a love of history. But I'll bring it back to the story of creation, the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. Their temptation was to take from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But here's the thing, they already had a knowledge of good, and they were tempted to become more, tempted to make themselves more than human. That was their temptation, and they took it. And that, if nothing else, I think should warn us that this temptation is going to be there. If we try to throw off a vice, we're going to be faced with seeing the death of some experience or some piece of knowledge that no one else might ever see again. And I'll even compare it to something that one of those popular militant atheists said. You know, like the people who are absolutely adamant that there is no God, but that's not enough for them. They have to convince other people that there is no God, and some of them even go as far as writing books about it. Well, the author of one of those books, I forget which one it is now. I think it might have been Dawkins. I, I forget. Don't quote me on that. But at some point, one of these authors said something to the effect of, if they have persuaded every single Christian on the globe, except one, 
to adopt atheism, and if they had the opportunity to persuade that one last Christian to give up religion, they wouldn't do it. And it was hard to articulate why, but I think this hits on the same thing. It's that death of knowledge. We're afraid of killing human knowledge. And I think this same thing is something that was weighing on the character Jason's heart as well. When he was looking through his flow walking visions and seeing the death of Lumaya without her knowledge being passed on to him. But then back to the plot, back to the moment before Nalani dies, they have a few brief words, and Nalani tries to plea with him. Well, pleas for her life, yes, but that's not the primary driving factor of why she does it. It's more like pleading with him for his own soul. Quote, if you do this, you'll become something destructive, unquote. Another quote from Nalani. What do you call someone who kills without needing to? who joins sides with evil because of a well-reasoned argument, unquote. And quote from the narrator, he was about to cut through the connective tissue between Nalani and all her potential futures, and he could feel the pain of that cut, unquote. Meaning that Jason is able to flow walk and see what her future life would have been like, or at least very many potential paths she could have taken if she's allowed to walk out of this mission today alive. And even seeing that, even knowing that, he makes the painful choice to kill her anyway. And you were expecting just a trashy sci-fi paperback. No, there's a reason I like these books, man. But after all that's finished up, Jason talks to Lamaya and agrees that he will be her apprentice. They find Ben unconscious, and Jason is able to carry Ben out of there. Quote from Lamaya, I know this was hurtful, Jason, but you've been strengthened by it already, unquote. So that's more about that concept of sacrificing for the greater good, which is weird because self-sacrifice in the Star Wars context can be called a Jedi trait, but in the real world context is often a Christian trait. But it's not the same as that, though. It's more like emotional sacrifice. It's more like sacrificing love, which love is supposed to be the main point of life and everything. Another quote, The Jedi find their balance through the abandonment of attachment. The Sith celebrate attachment, but find our balance in the deliberate, agonizing sacrifice of the things we love most. Only by that means can we retain our appreciation of the loss, pain, mortality, those things that ordinary people experience." Unquote. Lumaya then tells Jason that he needs to look for a Sith apprentice. She realizes he has a Jedi apprentice, Ben. He may or may not be suitable, but in any case he needs a Sith apprentice. And another piece of parting advice from Lumaya, quote, your greatest attainment of knowledge and power will come at the same time as your greatest sacrifice, unquote. Speaking of the sacrifice that was prophesized in that tassel that she made, and we're left on sort of a cliffhanger wondering what that sacrifice will be what form that will take. We see Jason leave the asteroid, but there's a brief scene that Lumaya is talking to that shadowy Sith figure, you know, the first Sith figure that Jason saw before the Shadow Luke appeared. It's a hooded figure, but then it's revealed to the reader that this force projection is a dark side force energy coming from the caves, but then twisted to shape Lumaya's imagination. And the form that this force projection twisted itself into was the potential future Sith Lord that Jason Jason will become. So when this figure draws back the hood over its face, this figure is Jason. And then flashback to Coruscant, Luke and Mara are recovering from their battles, and then Luke suddenly realizes that he still doesn't know who the man who doesn't exist is, but he now knows that the man who doesn't exist finally exists. And that is where the narrative of the book ends, but of course now we need to examine some of the more abstract takeaways from the book and how these abstract takeaways can apply to our own lives. A uh, general note here, I think the book does a good job of showing how the technology in this world is different, but also how people are the same. And I think it's a popular attitude to take that it's easy to view the world today as being somehow fundamentally different from the world, even half a century ago, because of the internet and computers and how interconnected everything is. But I think, to a large extent, people are the same. Human nature hasn't changed. This technology changes how we do things, but at the end of the day, politics are the same, interpersonal drama is the same, competitive spirit is the same. Lots of these human traits don't go away. Another note about the book, I think in this particular series, the Legacy of the Force series, I think the Force powers, the Force abilities that all the Jedi have are a little bit overpowered, and I think the writers came to realize that after these books were done, because the very next series in order, in chronological order of the universe timeline, tones 
brings down all the Jedi's ability to, like, sense when someone's coming, to sense when someone's there, to sense each other's emotions through the Force, even to communicate at long distances. So that's something I made note of. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of this recording, at least I think I did, I recorded this over six sessions to be exact. So in that first session where I recorded the introduction, I believe I mentioned that these books were published in the decade of the 2000s. They were published in the wake of of the heavy American reaction to 9-11. So we see the Patriot Act, we see restrictions on privacy, we see a lot more airport security than there used to be, all these changes. American society felt like, at that time, felt like it was a lot becoming a lot more restrictive, a lot less friendly, a lot less personal. And it felt like there was a degrading of trust between the government and the people. The government no longer trusted the people, anyone could be a potential terrorist. Which is true, anyone can be a potential terrorist, but it's just in the 90s, there was still that element of trust that we felt comfortable that we didn't have to think about that. And there was a lot of discomfort from that being ripped away. And that discomfort caused this huge backlash after 9-11. But then there's also a knee-jerk response against that backlash. And this book is sort of a fictionalized illustration, a product of that knee-jerk response against the backlash. But also a little bit in this book and a lot in book two that I'm going to cover. I, 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 I'm telling you this story now, this book, to go through to give context for the next book. The next book is the one that is really applicable, I think at least, to the situation in Gaza that we're seeing right now. And it's applicable because of a lot of those same themes it had, themes that it took from being that knee-jerk reaction against the backlash to 9-11. Stuff like the political intrigue, the opinions, the political opinions of average people in this book. We're going to see a lot more of that in the next book, and I'm excited to get to that. But onto my next note. This particular note is more just aimless speculation, aimless pondering of what the character of Jason might tell us or might illustrate about about how these certain catalyst individuals can really make or break world history. Because we see the direction that Jason is going. And now think about uh, Napoleon, or Andrew Jackson, or Genghis Khan. Think about where the world might be if Pope Urban II hadn't declared the First Crusade. Think about the Spanish kings that did the Reconquistas. Think about the way that Hitler really tapped into the discontent of the German people at the time and successfully funneled it in one particular direction. Think about, in almost all these cases, there was some sort of mass grievance among the people. The situation was, at least to some extent, primed to it, but at the same time, these singular individuals, they were in the right place at the right time, but also their force of personality. If that exact individual had not been there, things would have gone differently. Saddam Hussein, Joseph Stalin, a lot of these names I'm naming off have done terrible things, but that's not the point of why I'm naming them off. More so, had any other person been in the position of the leader of the USSR in the 30s and 40s, the entire prison system system and the entire way that they fought in the Second World War would have been different. Had Hitler not been doing his own political maneuvering in the 30s, we may have seen Germany labor under that economic system for a longer period of time, or they may have taken out that grievance in a different way. And even had Donald Trump not been the one running for office in 2016, how many more election cycles of generic neoliberal candidate versus generic neoconservative candidate, how many more boring election cycles would we have seen and still been laboring under these horrible economic policies that we had under Bush, we had under Obama, we would have had under Clinton, and now we have them back under Biden. And not only that, but the corruption, the scheming, the literal assassination attempts of people they don't like. Where would America be if we didn't have that particular unique individual? Something else I want to mention was a quote from one of the conversations that Leia had when she was on board the Dodonna, right before the battle to retake Trollis. Quote, the GA tends to fall into the trap of thinking of the Corellians as naughty children. They're not. They're people who have never lost the pioneering spirit. Now, how true is that how true is it that the Israeli government tends to fall into the trap of thinking of the Palestinians as naughty children? The answer is, I don't know. My first language is English. I have never spoken Arabic. I simply do not know. And being a Westerner, being an English speaker, I can never get immersed enough into the culture to have a genuine feeling for how true or not true that statement may be. I've seen bits and pieces. I've seen things people posted online, but I've never been there firsthand. So I'm saying it's certainly a possibility it seems like a likely possibility, but at the end of the day, all these people making declarative statements about the situation when most of them have never been there, never even met someone from there, I think we all know a lot less than we think we do. Another thing I wanted to comment on was all the decisions that J. 
Jason made that were based off of things he's seen while flow walking. All these decisions that he's making, quote unquote, for the greater good, because of his view of future timelines. But is it really for the greater good? And I think the distinction that the authors, the three authors, wanted to make was whether we operate in our daily life out of love or whether it's just chasing cold hard results. And I think unknowingly they hit on the same distinction that Solzhenitsyn pointed out in Part 4, Chapter 1 of his book, Gulag Archipelago. The chapter title is The Ascent, and during this chapter he talks about a film that was played once in the prison, where the central theme of this film was, the result is what counts. That was the quote that was repeated to them over and over in the film, talking about the result of the labor, talking about the things that are accomplished. But Solzhenitsyn there realizes that cold hard results, cold hard physical problems, Progress doesn't account for the human spirit. Yeah, the Soviets were making advances in their space program, but what does that matter when they have so many million people locked up in prisons? And now I'm going to explore a little hypothetical question that the Star Wars nerds, the hardcore Star Wars nerds, Disney Star Wars does not count, Disney is not canon, Legends is canon, Disney is fake retcon Star Wars, the real Star Wars nerds can appreciate. What would this particular storyline have looked like if Anakin Solo, the younger brother of the twins had survived the Yuzhan Vong War, the mission he went on during the Vong War, the mission to destroy the Voxen. What would have happened if he would have come back alive from that? Well, I'm gonna be honest, from what I remember of Anakin's character, not necessarily when he was at the Academy, but during his teenage years, when he was starting to actually take an active role fighting in the Vong War, I remember him becoming a lot more of a hothead, sort of in contrast to that quiet, reserved kid that he used to be at the Academy. I honestly think that if he had survived that mission, he would have taken another equally dangerous mission, and probably not come back alive from that one. 